Chapter 9 George is introduced to work. Heathenish instincts of towlines. Ungrateful conduct of a double sculling skiff. Towers and toad. A use discovered for lovers. Strange disappearance of an elderly lady. Much haste. Less speed. Being towed by girls. Exciting sensation. The missing lock or the haunted river. Music. Saved. We made George work. Now we had got him. He did not want to work, of course. That goes without saying. He had had a hard time in the city, so he explained. Harris, who is callous in his nature and not prone to pity, said, Ah, and now you're going to have a hard time on the river for a change. Change is good for everyone. Out you get. He could not, in conscience, not even George's conscience, object, though he did suggest that perhaps it would be better for him to stop in the boat and get tea ready. Well, Harris and I towed, because getting tea was such a worrying work, and Harris and I looked tired. The only reply we made to this, however, was to pass him over the tow line, and he took it and stepped out. There is something very strange and unaccountable about a tow line. You roll it up with as much patience and care as you would take to fold up a new pair of trousers, and five minutes afterward, when you pick it up, it is one ghastly, soul-revolting tangle. I do not wish to be insulting, but I firmly believe that if you took an average tow line and stretched it out straight across the middle of a field and then turned your back on it for 30 seconds, that when you looked round again, you would find that it had got itself all together in a heap in the middle of the field and had twisted itself up and tied itself into knots and lost its two ends and become all loops. And it would take you a good half hour sitting down there on the grass and swearing all the while to disentangle it. That is my opinion of tow lines in general. Of course, there may be honorable exceptions. I do not say that there are not. There may be tow lines that are a credit to their profession, conscientious, respectable tow lines, tow lines that do not imagine they are crochet work and try to knit themselves up into anti-massacres the instant they are left to themselves. I say there may be such tow lines. I sincerely hope there are, but I have not met with them. This tow line I had taken in myself just before we had got to the lock. I would not let Harris touch it, because he is careless. I had looped it round slowly and cautiously, and tied it up in the middle, and folded it in two, and laid it down gently at the bottom of the boat. Harris had lifted it up scientifically, and had put it into George's hand. George had taken it firmly, and held it away from him, and had begun to unravel it as if he were taking the swaddling clothes off a newborn infant, and, before he had unwound a dozen yards, the thing was more like a badly made doormat than anything else. It is always the same, and the same sort of thing always goes in connection with it. The man on the bank who is trying to disentangle it thinks all the fault lies with the man who rolled it up, and when a man up the river thinks a thing, he says it. What have you been trying to do with it? Make a fishing net of it? You've made a nice mess, you have. Why couldn't you wind it up properly, you silly dummy? He grunts from time to time as he struggles wildly with it and lays it out flat on the towpath and runs round and round, trying to find the end. On the other hand, the man who wound it up thinks the whole cause of the muddle rests with the man who is trying to unwind it. It was all right when you took it, he exclaims indignantly. Why don't you think what you're doing? You go about things in such a slapdash style. You get a scaffolding pole entangled, you would. And they feel so angry with one another that they would like to hang each other with a thing. Ten minutes go by, and the first man gives a yell and goes mad and dances on the rope and tries to pull it straight by seizing hold of the first piece that comes to his hand and hauling at it. Of course, this only gets it into a tighter tangle than ever. Then the second man climbs out of the boat and comes to help him, and they get in each other's way and hinder one another. They both get hold of the same bit of line and pull at it in opposite directions and wonder where it is caught. In the end, they do get it clear, and then turn round and find that the boat has drifted off and is making straight for the weir. This really happened once to my own knowledge. It was up by Boveney, one rather windy morning. We were pulling downstream, and as we came round the bend, we noticed a couple of men on the bank. They were looking at each other as bewildered and helplessly miserable expression as I have ever witnessed on any human countenance before or since. And they held a long tow line between them. It was clear that something had happened. 
So we eased up and asked them what was the matter. Why are boats gone off? They replied in an indignant tone. We just got out to disentangle the tow line, and when we looked round, it was gone. And they seemed hurt at what they evidently regarded as a mean and ungrateful act on the part of the boat. We found the truant for them a half mile further down, held by some rushes, and we brought it back to them. I bet they did not give that boat another chance for a week. I shall never forget the picture of those two men walking up and down the bank with a tow line, looking for their boat. One sees a good many funny incidents up on the river in connection with towing. One of the most common is the sight of a couple of towers walking briskly along, deep in an animated discussion, while the man in the boat, a hundred yards behind them, is vainly shrieking to them to stop and making frantic signs of distress with a skull. Something has gone wrong. The rudder has come off, or the boat hook has slipped overboard, or his hat has dropped into the water and is floating rapidly downstream. He calls to them to stop, quite gently and politely at first. Aye, stop a minute, will you? He shouts cheerily. I've dropped my hat overboard. Then, Hi, Tom, Dick, can't you hear? Not quite so affably this time. Then, Hi, confound you, you dunderheaded idiots! Hi, stop! Oh, you! After that, he springs and dances about and roars himself red in the face and curses everything he knows and the small boys on the bank stop and jeer at him and pitch stones at him as he is pulled along past them at the rate of four miles an hour and can't get out. Much of this sort of trouble will be saved if those who are towing would keep remembering that they are towing, and give a pretty frequent look round to see how their man is getting on. It is best to let one person tow. When two are doing it, they get chattering, and forget, and the boat itself, offering, as it does, but little resistance, is of no real service in reminding them of the fact. As an example of how utterly oblivious a pair of towers can be at their work, George told us later on in the evening, when we were discussing the subject after supper, of a very curious instance. He and three other men, so he said, were sculling a very heavily laden boat up from Maidenhead one evening, and a little above Cookham Lock they noticed a fellow and a girl walking along the towpath, both deep in an apparently interesting and absorbing conversation. They were carrying a boat hook between them, and, attached to the boat hook, was a tow line which trailed behind them, its end in the water. No boat was near, no boat was in sight. There must have been a boat attached to that tow line at some time or other. That was certain. But what had become of it, what ghastly fate had overtaken it, and those who had been left in it, was buried in mystery. Whatever the accident may have been, however, it had in no way disturbed the young lady and gentleman who were towing. They had the boat hook, and they had the line, and that seemed to be all they thought necessary to their work. George was about to call out and wake them up, but at that moment a bright idea flashed across him, and he didn't. He got the hitcher instead and reached over and drew in the end of the tow line, and they made a loop in it and put it over their mast, and then they tidied up the skulls and went and sat down in the stern and lit their pipes. And that young man and young woman towed those four hulking chaps and a heavy boat up to Marlow. George said he never saw so much thoughtful sadness concentrated into one glance before, as when, at the lock, that young couple grasped the idea that for the last two miles they had been towing the wrong boat. George fancied that, if it had not been for the restraining influence of the sweet woman at his side, the young man might have given way to violent language. The maiden was the first to recover from her surprise, and, when she did, she clasped her hands and said wildly, "'Oh, Henry, then where is Auntie?' "'Did they ever recover the old lady?' asked Harris. George replied he did not know. Another example of the dangerous want of sympathy between Tower and Toad was witnessed by George and myself once up near Walton. It was where the towpath shelves gently down into the water, and we were camping on the opposite bank, noticing things in general. By and by, a small boat came in sight, towed through the water at a tremendous pace by a powerful barge horse on which sat a very small boy. Scattered about the boat, in dreamy and reposeful attitudes, lay five fellows, the man who was steering having a particularly restful appearance. "'I should like to see him pull the wrong line,' murmured George as they passed." And at that precise moment the man did it, and the boat rushed up the bank with a noise like the ripping up of forty thousand linen sheets. 
two men, a hamper, and three oars immediately left the boat on the larboard side and reclined on the bank, and one and a half moments afterwards, two other men disembarked from the starboard and sat down among the boat hooks and sails and carpet bags and bottles. The last man went on twenty yards further and then got out on his head. This seemed to sort of lighten the boat, and it went on much easier, the small boy shouting at the top of his voice and urging his steed into a gallop. The fellows sat up and stared at one another. It was some seconds before they realized what had happened to them, but when they did, they began to shout lustily for the boy to stop. He, however, was much too occupied with the horse to hear them, and we watched them flying after him until the distance hid them from view. I cannot say I was sorry at their mishap. Indeed, I only wish that all the young fools who have their boats towed in this fashion, and plenty do, could meet with similar misfortunes. Besides, the risk they run themselves, they become a danger and an annoyance to every other boat they pass. Going at the pace they do, it is impossible for them to get out of everybody else's way or for anybody else to get out of theirs. Their line gets hitched across your mast and overturns you, or it catches somebody in the boat and either throws them into the water or cuts their face open. The best plan is to stand your ground and be prepared to keep them off with the butt end of a mast. Of all experiences in connection with towing, the most exciting is being towed by girls. It is a sensation that nobody ought to miss. It takes three girls to tow always. Two hold the rope, and the other one runs round and round and giggles. They generally begin by getting themselves tied up. They get the line round their legs and have to sit down on the path and undo each other, and then they twist it round their necks and are nearly strangled. They fix it straight, however, at last, and start off at a run, pulling the boat quite along at a dangerous pace. At the end of a hundred yards, they are naturally breathless, and suddenly stop, and all sit down on the grass and laugh, and your boat drifts out to midstream and turns around before you know what has happened or can get hold of the skull. Then they stand up and are surprised. Oh, look, they say, he's gone right out into the middle. They pull on pretty steadily for a bit after this, and then... It all at once occurs to one of them that she will pin up her frock, and they ease up for the purpose, and the boat runs aground. You jump up and push it off, and you shout to them not to stop. Yes? What's the matter? They shout back. Don't stop! You roar. Don't what? Don't stop! Go on! Go on! Go back, Emily, and see what it is they want says one, and Emily comes back and asks what it is. "'What do you want?' she says. "'Anything happened?' "'No,' you reply. "'It's all right. Only go on, you know. Don't stop.' "'Why not?' "'Why, we can't steer if you keep stopping. You must keep some way on the boat.' "'Keep some what?' "'Some way. You must keep the boat moving.' "'Oh, all right, I'll tell him.' Are we doing it all right? Oh, yes, very nicely indeed, only don't stop. It doesn't seem difficult at all. I thought it was so hard. Oh, no, it's simple enough. You want to keep on steady at it, that's all. I see. Give me out my red shawl. It's under the cushion. You find the shawl and hand it out, and by this time another one has come back and thinks she will have hers too, and they take Mary's on chance, and Mary does not want it, so they bring it back and have a pocket comb instead. It is about twenty minutes before they get off again, and at the next corner they see a cow, and you have to leave the boat to shivvy the cow out of their way. There is never a dull moment in the boat while girls are towing it. George got the line right after a while and towed us steadily on to Penton Hook. There we discussed the important question of camping. We had decided to sleep on board that night and we had either to lay up just about there or go on past Staines. It seemed early to think about shutting up then, however, with the sun still in the heavens, and we settled to push straight on for Runnymede, three and a half miles further, a quiet wooded part of the river where there is good shelter. We all wished, however, afterward, that we had stopped at Penton Hook. Three or four miles upstream is a trifle, early in the morning, but it is a weary pull at the end of a long day. You take no interest in the scenery during these last few miles. You do not chat and laugh. Every half mile you cover seems like two. 
You can hardly believe you are only where you are, and you are convinced that the last map must be wrong. And when you have trudged along for what seems to you at least 10 miles, and still the lock is not in sight, you begin to seriously fear that somebody must have sneaked it and run off with it. I remember being terribly upset once in the river, in a figurative sense, I mean. I was out with a young lady, cousin on my mother's side, and we were pulling down toward Goring. It was rather late, and we were anxious to get in. At least she was anxious to get in. It was half past six when we reached Benson's lock, and dusk was drawing on, and she began to get excited then. She said she must be into supper. I said it was a thing I felt I wanted to be in at, too, and I drew out a map I had with me to see exactly how far it was. I saw it was just a mile and a half to the next lock, Wallingford, and five on from there to Cleve. "'Oh, it's all right,' I said. "'We'll be through the next lock before seven, and there is only one more,' and I settled down and pulled steadily away. We passed the bridge, and soon after that I asked if she saw the lock. She said no, she did not see any lock, and I said, oh, and pulled on. Another five minutes went by, and then I asked her to look again. No, she said, I can't see any signs of a lock. You, you are sure you know a lock when you see one? I asked hesitatingly, not wishing to offend her. The question did offend her, however, and she suggested that I had better look for myself. So I laid down the skulls and took a view. The river stretched out straight before us in the twilight for about a mile. Not a ghost of a lock was to be seen. "'You don't think we've lost our way, do you?' asked my companion. I did not see how that was possible, though, as I suggested, we might have somehow got into the weir stream and be making for the falls.' This idea did not comfort her in the least, and she began to cry. She said we should both be drowned, and that it was a judgment on her for coming out with me. It seemed an excessive punishment, I thought, but my cousin thought not, and hoped it would all be soon over. I tried to reassure her, and to make light of the whole affair, I said that the fact evidently was that I was not rowing as fast as I fancied I was, but that we should soon reach the lock now, and I pulled on for another mile. Then I began to get nervous myself. I looked again at the map. There was Wallingford Lock, clearly marked, a mile and a half below Benson's. It was a good, reliable map, and besides, I recollected the lock myself. I had been through it twice. Where were we? What had happened to us? I began to think it must all be a dream, and that I was really asleep in bed and should wake up in a minute and be told it was past ten. I asked my cousin if she thought it could be a dream, and she replied that she was just about to ask me the same question, and then we both wondered if we were both asleep, and if so, who was the real one that was dreaming, and who was the one that was only a dream? It got quite interesting. I still went on pulling, however, and still no lock came in sight, and the river grew more and more gloomy and mysterious under the gathering shadows of night, and things seemed to be getting weird and uncanny. I thought of hobgoblins and banshees and will-o'-the-wisps and those wicked girls who sit up all night on rocks and lure people into whirlpools and things, and I wished I had been a better man and knew more hymns, and in the middle of these reflections I heard the blessed strains of He's Got Em On played badly on a concertina and knew that we were saved. I do not admire the tones of a concertina as a rule, but oh, how beautiful the music seemed to us both then. Far, far more beautiful than the voice of Orpheus or the lute of Apollo or anything of that sort could have sounded. Heavenly melody, in our then state of mind, would only have still further harrowed us. A soul-moving harmony, correctly performed, we should have taken as a spirit warning and have given up all hope. But about the strains of He's Got Em On, jerked spasmodically and with involuntary variations out of a wheezy accordion, there was something singularly human and reassuring. The sweet sounds drew nearer, and soon the boat from which they were worked lay alongside us. It contained a party of provincial Aries and Ariettes out for a moonlit sail. There was not any moon, but that was not their fault. I never saw more attractive, lovable people in all my life. I hailed them and asked if they could tell me the way to Wallingford Lock, and I explained that I had been looking for it for the last two hours. Wallingford Lock, they answered. Lord love you, sir. That's been done away with for over a year. There ain't no Wallingford Lock now, sir. 
You're close to Cleve now. Blow me tight if there ain't a gentleman been looking for Wallen for lock, Bill. I had never thought of that. I wanted to fall upon all their necks and bless them, but the stream was running too strong just there to allow this, so I had to content myself with a mere cold-sounding words of gratitude. We thanked them over and over again, and said it was a lovely night, and we wished them a pleasant trip, and, I think, invited them all to come and spend a week with me, and my cousin said her mother would be so pleased to see them. And we sang Soldier's Chorus to Faust, and got home in time for supper, after all. Chapter 10 Our First Night, Under Canvas, An Appeal for Help Contrariness of tea kettles, how to overcome. Supper, how to feel virtuous. Wanted, a comfortably appointed, well-drained desert island, neighborhood of South Pacific Ocean preferred. Funny thing that happened to George's father. A restless night. Harris and I began to think that Bellweir Lock must have been done away with after the same manner. George had towed us up to Staines, and we had taken the boat from there, and it seemed that we were dragging fifty tons after us and were walking forty miles. It was half-past seven when we were through, and we all got in and sculled up close to the left bank, looking out for a spot to haul up in. We had originally intended to go on to Magna Carta Island, a sweetly pretty part of the river, where it winds through a soft green valley, and to camp in one of the many picturesque inlets to be found round that tiny shore. But somehow we did not feel that we yearned for the picturesque nearly so much now as we had earlier in the day. A bit of water between a coal barge and a gas works would ha quite have satisfied us for the night. We did not want scenery. We wanted to have our supper and go to bed. However, we did pull up to the point, Picnic Point, it is called, and dropped into a very pleasant nook under a great elm tree, to the spreading roots of which we fastened the boat. Then we thought we were going to have supper— we had dispensed with tea so as to save time. But George said no, that we had better get the canvas up first before it got quite dark, and while we could see what we were doing. Then, he said, all our work would be done, and we could sit down to eat with an easy mind. That canvas wanted more putting up than I think any of us had bargained for. It looked so simple in the abstract. You took five iron arches, like gigantic croquet hoops, and fitted them up over the boat, and then stretched the canvas over them and fastened it down. It would take quite ten minutes, we thought. That was an underestimate. We took the hoops and began to drop them into the sockets placed for them. You would not imagine this to be dangerous work, but, looking back now, the wonder to me is that any of us are alive to tell the tale. They were not hoops. They were demons. First, they would not fit into their sockets at all, and we had to jump them on and kick them and hammer them with the boat hook, and when they were in, it turned out that they were the wrong hoops for those particular sockets, and they had to come out again. But they would not come out until two of us had gone and struggled with them for five minutes, when they would jump up suddenly and try to throw us into the water and drown us. They had hinges in the middle, and, when we were not looking, they nipped us with these hinges in delicate parts of the body, and while we were wrestling with one side of the hoop and endeavoring to persuade it to do its duty, the other side would come behind us in a cowardly manner and hit us over the head. We had got them fixed at last, and then all that was to be done was to arrange the covering over them. George unrolled it and fastened one end over the nose of the boat. Harris stood in the middle to take it from George and roll it on to me, and I kept by the stern to receive it. It was a long time coming down to me. George did his part all right, but, I was, but it was new work to Harris, and he bungled it. How he managed to do it, I do not know. He could not explain himself. But by some mysterious process or other, he succeeded, after ten minutes of superhuman effort, in getting himself completely rolled up in it. He was so firmly wrapped round and tucked in and folded over that he could knock it out. He, of course, made frantic struggles for freedom, the birthright of every Englishman, and in doing so, I learned this afterward, knocked over George, and then George, swearing at Harris, began to struggle too, and got himself entangled and rolled up. I knew nothing about this at the time. I did not understand the business myself. I had been told to stand where I was and wait till the canvas came to me, and Montmorency and I stood there and waited, both as good as gold. We could see the canvas being violently jerked and tossed about, pretty considerably, but we supposed this was part of the method, and did not interfere. 
We also heard much smothered language coming from underneath it, and we guessed they were finding the job rather troublesome, and concluded that we would wait until things had got a little simpler before we joined in. We waited some time, but matters seemed to get only more and more involved, until at last George's head came wriggling out over the side of the boat and spoke up. It said, Give us a hand here, can't you, you cuckoo, standing there like a stuffed mummy when you see we are both being suffocated, you dummy. I never could withstand an appeal for help, so I went and undid them. Not before it was time, either, for Harris was nearly black in the face. It took us half an hour's hard labor after that before it was properly up, and then we cleared the decks and got out supper. We put the kettle on to boil up in the nose of the boat, and we went down to the stern and pretended to take no notice of it, but set to work to get the other things out. That is the only way to get a kettle to boil up the river. If it sees that you are waiting for it, and anxious, it will never even sing. You have to go away and begin your meal as if you're not going to have any tea at all. You must not even look round at it. Then you will soon hear it sputtering away, mad to be made into tea. It is a good plan, too, if you're in a great hurry to talk very loudly to each other about how you don't need any tea and are not going to have any. You get near the kettle so that it can overhear you, and then you shout out, I don't want any tea, do you, George? To which George shout, shouts back, Oh no, I don't like tea. We'll have lemonade instead. Tea is so indigestible. Upon which the kettle boils over and puts the stove out. We adopted this harmless bit of trickery, and the result was that, by the time everything else was ready, the tea was waiting. Then we lit the lantern and squatted down to supper. We wanted that supper. For five and thirty minutes, not a sound was heard throughout the length and breadth of that boat, save the clank of cutlery and crockery and the steady grinding of our four sets of molars. At the end of five and thirty minutes, Harris said, Ah, and took his left leg out from under him and put his right one there instead. Five minutes afterwards, George said, Ah, too, and threw his plate out on the bank. And three minutes later after that, Montmorency gave the first sign of contentment he had exhibited since we had started, and rolled over on his side and spread his legs out. And then I said, Ah, and bent my head back and bumped it against one of the hoops, but I did not mind it. I did not even swear. How good one feels when one is full. How satisfied with ourselves and with the world. People who have tried it, Tell me that a clear conscience makes you very happy and contented. But a full stomach does the business quite as well, and is cheaper, and more easily obtained. One feels so forgiving and generous after a substantial and well-digested meal, so noble-minded, so kindly-hearted. It is very strange, this domination of our intellect by our digestive organs. We cannot work, we cannot think, unless our stomach wills so. It dictates to us our emotions, our passions. After eggs and bacon, it says, work. After beefsteak and porter, it says, sleep. After a cup of tea, two spoonfuls for each cup, and don't let it stand more than three minutes, it says to the brain, now rise and show your strength. Be eloquent and deep and tender. See with a clear eye into nature and into life. Spread your white wings of quivering thought and soar, a godlike spirit, over the whirling world beneath you, up through long lanes of flaming stars to the gates of eternity. After hot muffins, it says, Be dull and soulless, like a beast of the field, a brainless animal with a listless eye, unlit by any ray of fancy or of hope or fear or love or life. And after brandy taken in sufficient quantity, it says, now come, fool, grin and tumble, that your fellow men may laugh, drivel in folly and splutter in senseless sounds, and show what a helpless ninny is poor man whose wit and will are drowned, like kittens side by side, in half an inch of alcohol. We are but the various sorriest slaves of our stomach. Reach not after morality and righteousness, my friends. Watch vigilantly your stomach, and diet it with care and judgment. Then virtue and contentment will come and reign within your heart, unsought by any effort of your own, and you will be a good citizen, a loving husband, and a tender father, a noble, pious man. Before our supper, Harris and George and I were quarrelsome and snappy and ill-tempered. 
After our supper, we sat and beamed at one another, and we beamed upon the dog, too. We loved each other. We loved everybody. Harris, in moving about, trod on George's corn. Had this happened before supper, George would have expressed wishes and desires concerning Harris's fate in this world and the next that would have made a thoughtful man shudder. As it was, he said, Steady, old man, wear wheat. And Harris, instead of merely observing in his most unpleasant tones that a fellow could hardly help treading on some bit of George's foot if he had to move about at all within ten yards of where George was sitting, suggesting that George never ought to come into an ordinary-sized boat with feet that length and advising him to hang them over the side, as he would have done before supper, now said, "'Oh, I'm sorry, old chap. I hope I haven't hurt you.' And George said, "'Not at all. That it was his fault. And Harris said, "'No, it was his.' It was quite pretty to hear them. We lit our pipes and sat, looking out on the quiet night and talked. George said, why couldn't we not always be like this, away from the world with its sin and temptation, leading sober, peaceful lives and doing good? I said it was a sort of thing I had often longed for myself, and we discussed the possibility of our going away, we four, to some handy, well-fitted desert island and living there in the woods. Harris said that the danger about desert islands, as far as he had heard, was that they were so damp. But George said no, not if properly drained. And then we got on to drains, and that put George in mind of a very funny thing that happened to his father once. He said his father was traveling with another fellow through Wales, and one night they stopped at a little inn where there were some other fellows, and they joined the other fellows and spent the evening with them. They had a very jolly evening and sat up late. And by the time they came to bed, they, this was when George's father was a very young man, were slightly jolly too. They, George's father and George's father's friend, were to sleep in the same room, but in different beds. They took the candle and went up. The candle lurched against the wall when they got into the room and went out, and they had to undress and grope into bed in the dark. This they did, but instead of getting into separate beds, as they thought they were doing, they both climbed into the same one without knowing it one getting in with his head at the top and the other crawling in from the opposite side of the compass and lying with his feet on the pillow. There was silence for a moment, and then George's father said, "'Joe?' "'What's the matter, Tom?' replied Joe's voice from the other end of the bed. "'Why, there's a man in my bed,' said George's father. "'Here's his feet on my pillow.' "'Well, that's an extraordinary thing, Tom,' answered the other. "'But I'm blessed if there isn't a man in my bed, too.' "'What are you going to do?' asked George's father. "'Well, I'm going to chuck him out,' replied Joe. "'So am I,' said George's father, valiantly. There was a brief struggle, followed by two heavy bumps on the floor, and then a rather doleful voice said, "'I say, Tom.' "'Yes? How have you got on?' "'Well, to tell you the truth, my man's chucked me out. "'So's mine. I say, I don't think much of this inn, do you?' "'What was the name of that inn?' said Harris. "'The Pig and Whistle,' said George. "'Why?' "'Ah, no, then it isn't the same place,' replied Harris. "'What do you mean?' queried George. "'Why, it's so curious,' murmured Harris, "'but precisely that very same thing happened to my father once at a country inn. "'I've often heard him tell the tale. "'I thought it might have been the same inn.' "'We turned in at ten that night, and I thought I should sleep well, being tired, but I didn't. As a rule, I undress and put my head on the pillow, and then somebody bangs the door and says it's half past eight. But tonight, everything seemed against me. The novelty of it all, the hardness of the boat, the cramped position. I was lying with my feet under one seat and my head on another. The sound of the lapping water around the boat and the wind among the branches kept me restless and disturbed. I did get to sleep for a few hours, and then some part of the boat which seemed to have grown up in the night, for it certainly was not there when we started, and it had disappeared by the morning, kept digging into my spine. I slept through it for a while, dreaming I had swallowed a sovereign, and that they were cutting a hole in my back with a gimlet so as to try and get it out. I thought it very unkind of them, and I told them I would owe them the money, and they should have it at the end of the month. But they would not hear of it, and said that I would be much better if they had it then, because otherwise the interest would accumulate so. I got quite cross with them after a bit and told them what I thought of them, and then they gave the gimlet such an excruciating wrench that I woke up. The boat seemed stuffy, and my head ached, so I thought I would step out into the cool night air. 
I slipped on what clothes I could find about, some of my own and some of George's and Harris's, and crept under the canvas onto the bank. It was a glorious night. The moon had sunk and left the quiet earth alone with the stars. It seemed as if, in the silence and the hush, while we, her children, slept, they were talking with her, their sister, conversing of mighty mysteries and voices too vast and deep for childish human ears to catch the sound. They awe us, these strange stars, so cold, so clear. We are as children whose small feet have strayed into some dim-lit temple of the god they have been taught to worship but know not, and standing where the echoing dome spans the long vista of the shadowy light, glance up, half hoping, half afraid, to see some awful vision hovering there. And yet it seems so full of comfort and of strength, the night. In its great presence, our small sorrows creep away ashamed. The day has been so full of fret and care, and our hearts have been so full of evil and of bitter thoughts, and the world has seemed so hard and wrong to us. Then night, like some great loving mother, gently lays her hand upon our fevered head, and turns our little tear-stained faces up to hers, and smiles. And though she does not speak, we know what she would say, and lay our hot, flushed cheeks against her bosom, and the pain is gone. Sometimes our pain is very deep and real, and we stand before her very silent, because there is no language for our pain, only a moan. Night's heart is full of pity for us. She cannot ease our aching. She takes our hand in hers, and the little world grows very small and very far away beneath us. And borne on her dark wings, we pass for a moment into a mightier presence than her own. And in the wondrous light of that great presence, all human life lies like a book before us, and we know that pain and sorrow are but the angels of God. Only those who have worn the crown of suffering can look upon that wondrous light. And they, when they return, may not speak of it, or tell the mystery they know. Once upon a time, through a strange country, there rode some goodly knights, and their path lay by a deep wood, where tangled briars grew very thick and strong, and tore the flesh of them that lost their way therein. And the leaves of the trees that grew in the wood were very dark and thick, so that no ray of light came through the branches to lighten the gloom and sadness. And as they passed by that dark wood, one knight of those that rode, missing his comrades, wandered far away and returned to them no more, and they, sorely grieving, rode on without him, mourning him as one dead. Now, when they reached the fair castle towards which they had been journeying, they stayed there many days and made merry, and one night, as they sat in cheerful ease around the logs that burned in the great hall and drank a loving measure, there came the comrade they had lost and greeted them. His clothes were ragged, like a beggar's, and many sad wounds were on his sweet flesh, but upon his face there shone a great radiance of deep joy. And they questioned him, asking him what had befallen him, and he told them how in the dark wood he had lost his way, and had wandered many days and many nights, till, torn and bleeding, he had lain him down to die. Then, when he was nigh unto death, lo, through the savage gloom there came to him a stately maiden, and took him by the hand, and led him on through devious paths unknown to any man, until upon the darkness of the wood there dawned a light such as the light of day was unto but us a little lamp unto the sun. And in that wondrous light our way-worn knight saw as in a dream a vision, and so glorious, so fair the vision seemed, that of his bleeding wounds he thought no more, but stood as one entranced, whose joy is deep as the sea, whereof no man can tell the depth. And the vision faded, and the knight, kneeling upon the ground, thanked the good saint, who into that sad wood had strayed his steps, so that he had seen the vision that lay there hid. And the name of the dark forest was Sorrow, but of the vision that the good knight saw therein, we may not speak nor tell. Chapter 11 How George, once upon a time, got up early in the morning. George Harris of Montmorency do not like the look of the cold water. Heroism and determination on the part of Jay. George and his shirt. Story with a moral. Harris as cook. Historical retrospect, specially inserted for the use of schools. I woke at six the next morning and found George awake too. We both turned round and tried to go to sleep again, but we could not. 
Had there been any particular reason why we should not have gone to sleep again, but have got up and dressed then and there, we should have dropped off while we were looking at our watches, and have slept till ten. As there was no earthly necessity for our getting up, under another two hours at the very least, and our getting up at that time was an utter absurdity, it was only in keeping with the natural cussedness of things in general that we should both feel that lying down for five minutes more would be the death of us. George said that the same kind of thing, only worse, had happened to him some eighteen months ago when he was lodging by himself in the house of a certain Mrs. Gippings. He said his watch went wrong one evening and stopped at a quarter past eight. He did not know this at the time because, for some reason or other, he forgot to wind it up when he went to bed, an unusual occurrence with him, and hung it up over his pillow without ever looking at the thing. It was in the winter when this happened, very near the shortest day, and a week of fog into the bargain, and so the fact that it was still very dark when George woke in the morning was no guide to him as to the time. He reached up and hauled down his watch. It was quarter past eight. Angels and ministers of grace defend us, exclaimed George, and here I've got to be in the city by nine. Oh, why didn't somebody call me? Oh, this is a shame. And he flung the watch down and sprang out of bed and had a cold bath and washed himself and dressed himself and shaved himself in cold water because there was not time to wait for the hot, and then rushed and had another look at the watch. Whether the shaking it had received and being thrown down on the bed had started it, or how it was, George could not say, but certain it was that from a quarter past eight it had begun to go, and now pointed to twenty minutes to nine. George snatched it up and rushed downstairs. In the sitting room, all was dark and silent, and there was no fire, no breakfast. George said it was a wicked shame of Mrs. G, and he made up his mind to tell her what he thought of her when he came home in the evening. Then he dashed on his great coat and hat, and seizing his umbrella, made for the front door. The door was not even unbolted. George anathematized Mrs. G for a lazy old woman and thought it was very strange that people could not get up at a decent, respectable time, unlocked and unbolted the door, and ran out. He ran hard for a quarter of a mile. At the end of that distance, it began to be borne in upon him as a strange and curious thing there were so few people about and that there were no shops open. It was certainly a very dark and foggy morning, but still it seemed an unusual course to stop all business on that account. He had to go to business. Why should other people stop in bed merely because it was dark and foggy? At length, he reached Holborn. Not a shutter was down, not a bus was about. There were three men in sight, one of whom was a policeman. A market cart full of cabbages and dilapidated-looking cab. George pulled out his watch and looked at it. It was five minutes to nine. He stood still and counted his pulse. He stooped down and felt his legs. Then, with his watch still in his hand, he went up to the policeman and asked him if he knew what time it was. What's the time, said the man, eyeing George up and down with evident suspicion. Why, if you listen, you'll hear it strike. George listened, and a neighboring clock immediately obliged. It's only gone three, said George, in an injured tone, when it had finished. Well, and how many did you want it to go, replied the constable. Why, nine, said George, showing his watch. Do you know where you live, said the guardian of public order, severely. George thought, and gave the address. Oh, that's where it is, is it, replied the man. Well, you take my advice and go up there quietly. Take that watch of yours with you. Don't let's have any more of it. And George went home again, musing as he walked along and let himself in. At first, when he got in, he determined to undress and go to bed again, but when he thought of the redressing and rewashing and of the having of another bath, he determined he would not, but he would sit up and go to sleep in the easy chair. But he could not get to sleep. He never felt more wakeful in all his life. So he lit the lamp and got out the chessboard and played himself a game of chess. But even that did not enliven him. It seemed slow somehow. So he gave chess up and tried to read. He did not seem able to take any sort of interest in reading either. And so he put on his coat again 
and went out for a walk. It was horribly lonesome and dismal, and all the policemen he met regarded him with undisguised suspicion and turned their lanterns on him and followed him about. And this had such an effect upon him at last that he began to feel as if he had really done something, and he got to slinking down the by-streets and hiding in dark doorways when he heard the regulation flip-flop approaching. Of course, this conduct made the force only more distrustful of him than ever, and they would come and rout him out and ask him what he was doing there, and when he answered, nothing, he had merely come out for a stroll. It was then four o'clock in the morning. They looked as though they did not believe him, and two plainclothes constables came home with him to see if he really did live where he said he did. They saw him go in with his key, and then they took up a position opposite and watched the house. He thought he would light a fire when he got inside and make himself some breakfast, just to pass away the time, but he did not seem to be able to handle anything from a scuttleful of coals to a teaspoon without dropping it or falling over it, and making such a noise that he was in mortal fear that would wake up Mrs. G, and that she would think it was burglars, and open the window and call police, and then these two detectives would rush in and handcuff him, and march him off to the police court. He was in a morbidly nervous state by this time, and he pictured the trial, and his trying to explain the circumstances to the jury, and nobody believing him, and his being sentenced to twenty years' penal servitude, and his mother dying of a broken heart. So he gave up trying to get breakfast, and wrapped himself up in his overcoat, and sat in the easy chair till Mrs. G. came down at half-past seven. He said he'd never got up too early since that morning. It had been such a warning to him. We'd been sitting huddled up in our rugs when George had been telling me this true story. And on his finishing it, I set to work to wake up Harris with a skull. The third prod did it. He turned over on the other side and said he'd be down in a minute and that he would have his lace-up boots. We soon let him know where he was, however, by the aid of the hitcher. And he sat up suddenly, sending Montmorency, who had been sleeping the sleep of the just, right on the middle of his chest, sprawling across the boat. Then we pulled up the canvas, and all four of us poked our heads out over the offside and looked down at the water and shivered. The idea, overnight, had been that we should get up early in the morning, fling off our rugs and shawls, and, throwing back the canvas, spring into the river with a joyous shout, and revel in a long, delicious swim. Somehow, now the morning had come, and the notion seemed less tempting. The water looked damp and chilly. The wind felt cold. Well, who's going to be first in, said Harris at last. There was no rush for precedence. George settled the matter so far as he was concerned by retiring into the boat and pulling on his socks. Montmorency gave a vent to an involuntary howl, as if merely thinking of the thing had given him the horrors. And Harris said it would be so difficult to get into the boat again, and went back and sorted out his trousers. I did not altogether like to give in, though I did not relish the plunge. There might be snags about, or weeds, I thought. I meant to compromise matters by going down to the edge and just throwing the water over myself. So I took a towel and crept out onto the bank and wormed my way along on the branch of a tree that dipped down into the water. It was bitterly cold. The wind cut like a knife. I thought I would not throw the water over myself after all. I would go back into the boat and dress, and I turned to do so. And as I turned, the silly branch gave way and I and the towel went in together with a tremendous splash, and I was out midstream with a gallon of Thames water inside me before I knew what happened. By Jove, old Jay's gone in, I heard Harris say as I came blowing to the surface. I didn't think he'd have the pluck to do it. Did you? Is it all right? sung out George. Lovely, I sputtered back. You duffers are not to come in. I wouldn't have missed this for the worlds. Well, why don't you try it? It only wants a little determination. But I could not persuade them. Rather, an amusing thing happened while dressing that morning. It was very cold when I got back into the boat. In my hurry to get my shirt on, I accidentally jerked it into the water. It made me awfully wild, especially as George burst out laughing. I could not see anything to laugh at, and I told George so, and he only laughed the more. I never saw a man laugh so much. I quite lost my temper with him at last. I pointed out to him 
What a driveling maniac of an imbecile idiot he was. But he only roared the louder. And then, just as I was landing the shirt, I noticed it was not my shirt at all, but George's, which I had mistaken for mine. Whereupon the humor of the thing struck me for the first time, and I began to laugh. And the more I looked from George's wet shirt to George, roaring with laughter, the more I was amused. And I laughed so much that I had to let the shirt fall back into the water again. Aren't you, you, you going to get it out? said George between his shrieks. I could not answer him at all for a while. I was laughing so. But at last, between my peals, I managed to jerk out. <laughs> it isn't my shirt. It's yours. I never saw a man's face change from lively to severe so suddenly in all my life before. What? he yelled, springing up. You silly cuckoo. Why can't you be more careful with what you're doing? Why the deuce don't you go and dress on the bank? You're not fit to be in a boat, you're not. Give me the hitcher. I tried to make him see the fun of the thing, but he could not. George is very dense at seeing a joke sometimes. Harris proposed that we should have scrambled eggs for breakfast. He said he would cook them. It seemed, from his account, that he was very good at doing scrambled eggs. He often did them at picnics and went out on yachts. He was quite famous for them. People who had once tasted his scrambled eggs, so we gathered from his conversation, never cared for any other food afterward, but pined away and died when they could not get them. It made our mouths water to hear him talk about the things, and we handed him out the stove and the frying pan and all the eggs that had not smashed and gone over everything in the hamper and begged him to begin. He had some trouble in breaking the eggs, or rather not so much trouble in breaking them exactly, as getting them into the frying pan when broken, and keeping them off his trousers, and preventing them from running up his sleeve. But he fixed some half a dozen to the pan at last, and then squatted down by the side of the stove, and chivied them about with a fork. It seemed harassing work, so far as George and I could judge. Whenever he went near the pan, he burned himself, and then he would drop everything, and dance round the stove, flicking his fingers about and cursing the things. Indeed, every time George and I looked round at him, he was sure to be performing this feat. We thought it was at first a necessary part of the culinary arrangements. We did not know what the scrambled eggs were, and we fancied it must be some Red Indian or Sandwich Island sort of dish that requires dances and incantations for its proper cooking. Montmorency went and put his nose over it, and the fat spluttered up and scalded him, and then he began dancing and cursing. Altogether, it was one of the most interesting and exciting operations I've ever witnessed. George and I were both quite sorry when it was over. The result was not altogether the success that Harris had anticipated. There seemed so little to show for the business. Six eggs had gone into the frying pan, and all that came out was a teaspoonful of burnt and unappetizing-looking mess. Harris said it was the fault of the frying pan, and thought it would have gone better if we'd had a fish kettle and a gas stove, and we decided not to attempt the dish again till we had those aids to housekeeping by us. The sun had got more powerful by the time we'd finished breakfast, and the wind had dropped, and it was as lovely a morning as one could desire. Little was in sight to remind us of the 19th century, and as we looked out upon the river in that morning sunlight, we could almost fancy that the centuries between us and that ever-to-be-famous June morning of 1215 had been drawn aside, and that we, English yeomen's sons in homespun cloth, with dirk at belt, were waiting there to witness the writing of that stupendous page of history, the meaning whereof was to be translated to the common people some four hundred and odd years later by one Oliver Cromwell, who had deeply studied it. It is a fine summer morning, sunny, soft, and still, but through the air there runs a thrill of coming stir. King John has slept at Duncroft Hall, and all the day before, the little town of Staines has echoed to the clang of armed men and the clatter of great horses over its rough stones, and the shouts of captains, and the grim oaths and surly jests of bearded bowmen, billmen, pikemen, and strange-speaking foreign spearmen. Gay-cloaked companies of knights and squires have ridden in, all travel-stained and dusty, 
and all the evening long, the timid townsmen's doors have had to be quick opened to let in rough groups of soldiers, for whom there must be found both board and lodging, and the best of both, for woe betide the house and all within. For the sword is judge and jury, plaintiff and executioner, in these tempestuous times, and pays for what it takes by sparing those from whom it takes it, if it pleases to do so. Round the campfire in the marketplace gather still more of the baron's troops, and eat and drink deep, and bellow forth roistering drinking songs, and gamble and quarrel as the evening grows and deepens into night. The firelight sheds quaint shadows on their piled-up arms and on their uncouth forms. The children of town steal round to watch them, wondering, and brawny country wenches, laughing, draw near to bandy alehouse jest and jibe with the swaggering troopers, so unlike the village swains who, now despised, stand apart behind, with vacant grins upon their broad, peering faces. And out from the fields around glitter the faint lights of more distant camps, as here some great lord's followers lie mustered, and there false John's French mercenaries hover like crouching wolves without the town. And so, with sentinel in each dark street, and twinkling watchfires on each height around, the night has worn away, and over this fair valley of old Tem has broken the morning of the great day that is to close so big with the fate of ages yet unborn. Ever since gray dawn, in the lower of the two islands, just above where we are standing, there has been a great clamor, and the sound of many workmen. The great pavilion brought there yester-eve is being raised, and carpenters are busy nailing tiers of seats, while prentices from London town are there with many colored stuffs and silks and cloth of gold and silver. And now, lo, down upon the road that winds along the river's bank from Staines, there comes towards us, laughing and talking together in deep guttural bass, a half score of stalwart halberdmen, barons men these, and halt at a hundred yards or so above us on the other bank, and lean upon their arms and wait. And so, from hour to hour, march up along the road ever fresh groups and bands of armed men, their casques and breastplates flashing back the long, low lines of morning sunlight, until, as far as I can reach, the way seems thick with glittering steel and prancing steeds. And shouting horsemen are galloping from group to group, and little banners are fluttering lazily in the warm breeze, and every now and then is a deeper stir as the ranks make way on either side, and some great baron on his warhorse with his guard of squires around him, passes along to take his station at the head of his serfs and vassals. And up the slope of Cooper's Hill, just opposite, are gathered the wandering rustics and curious town folk who have run from Staines, and none are quite sure what the bustle is about, but each one has a different version of the great event that they have come to see, and some say that much good to all the people will come from this day's work, but the old men shake their heads, They've heard such tales before. And all the river down to Staines is dotted with small craft and boats and tiny coracles, which last are growing out of favor now and are used only by the poorer folk. Over the rapids, where in after years trim bell weir lock will stand, they've been forced or dragged by their sturdy rowers and now are crowding up as near as they dare come to the great covered barges which lie in readiness to bear King John to where the faithful charter waits his signing. It is noon, and we and all the people have been waiting patient for many an hour, and the rumor has run round that Slippery John has again escaped from the Baron's grasp, and has stolen away from Duncroft Hall with his mercenaries at his heels, and will soon be doing other work than signing charters for his people's liberty. Not so. This time the grip upon him has been one of iron, and he has slid and wriggled in vain, Far down the road a little cloud of dust has risen, and draws nearer and grows larger, and the pattering of many hooves grow louder, and in and out between the scattered groups of drawn-up men there pushes on its way a brilliant cavalcade of gay-dressed lords and knights. In front and rear and either flank there ride the yeomen of the barons, and in the midst King John. He rides to where the barges lie in readiness, and the great barons step forth from their ranks to meet him. He greets them with a smile and laugh and pleasant honeyed words, as though it were some feast in his honor to which he had been invited. But as he rises to dismount, he 
casts one hurried glance from his own French mercenaries drawn up in the rear to the grim ranks of the Baron's men that hem him in. Is it too late? One fierce blow at the unsuspecting horseman at his side. One cry to his French troops. One desperate charge upon the unready lines before him. And these rebellious barons might rue the day they dared to thwart his plans. A bolder hand might have turned the game, even at that point. Had it been a Richard there, the cup of liberty might have been dashed from England's lips, and the taste of freedom held back for a hundred years. But the heart of King John sinks before the stern faces of the English fighting men, and the arm of King John drops back onto his rein, and he dismounts and takes his seat in the foremost barge, and the barons follow in with each mailed hand upon the sword hilt, and the word is given to let go. Slowly, the heavy, bright-decked barges leave the shore of running mead. Slowly against the swift current, they work their ponderous way till, with a low grumble, they grade against the bank of Little Island that from this day will bear the name of Magna Carta Island. And King John has stepped upon the shore, and we wait in breathless silence till a great shout cleaves the air, and the great cornerstone in England's Temple of Liberty has, now we know, been firmly laid. Chapter 12 Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn Disadvantages of living in the same house with a pair of lovers A trying time for the English nation A night search for the picturesque Homeless and houseless Harris prepares to die An angel comes along Effect of sudden joy on Harris A little supper Lunch High price for mustard a fearful battle. Maidenhead. Sailing. Three fishers. We are cursed. I was sitting on the bank, conjuring up this scene to myself, when George remarked that when I was quite rested, perhaps I would not mind helping to wash up. And thus, recalled from the days of the glorious past to the prosaic present, with all its misery and sin, I slid down into the boat and cleaned out the frying pan with a stick of wood and a tuft of grass, polishing it up finally with George's wet shirt. We went over to Magna Carta Island and had a look at the stone which stands in the cottage there and on which the great charter is said to have been signed, though as to whether it really was signed there or, or as some say, on the other bank at Running Mead, I declined to commit myself. As far as my own personal opinion goes, however, I'm inclined to give weight to the popular island theory. Certainly, had I been one of the barons at the time, I should have strongly urged upon my comrades the advisability of our getting such a slippery customer as King John onto the island where there is less chance of surprises and tricks. There are ruins of an old priory on the grounds of Anchorwick House, which is close to Picnic Point, and it was round about the grounds of this old priory that Henry VIII is said to have waited for and met Anne Boleyn. He also used to meet her at Hever Castle in Kent, and also somewhere near St. Albans. It must have been difficult for the people of England in those days to have found a spot where these thoughtless young folk were not spooning. Have you ever been in a house where there is a couple courting? It's most trying. You think you will go sit in the drawing room, and you march off there. As you open the door, you hear a noise as if somebody had suddenly recollected something, and when you get in, Emily is over by the window, full of interest in the opposite side of the road, and your friend, John Edward, is at the other end of the room, with his whole soul held in thrall by photographs of other people's relatives. Oh, you say, pausing at the door. I didn't know anybody was in here. Oh, didn't you, says Emily, coldly, in a tone which implies that she does not believe you. You hang about for a bit, and then you say, It's very dark. Why don't you light the gas? John Edward says, Oh, he hadn't noticed it. And Emily says that Papa does not like the gas lit in the afternoon. You tell them one or two items of news and give them your views and opinions on the Irish question. But this does not appear to interest them. All they remark on any subject is, Oh, is it? Did he? Yes. And you don't say so. And after ten minutes of such style of conversation, 
you edge up to the door and slip out. And are surprised to find that the door immediately closes behind you and shuts itself without your having touched it. Half an hour later, you think you'll try a pipe in the conservatory. The only chair in the place is occupied by Emily, and John Edward, if the language of clothes can be relied upon, has evidently been sitting on the floor. They do not speak, but they give you a look that says all that can be said in a civilized community, and you back out promptly and shut the door behind you. You're afraid to poke your nose into any room in the house now, so after walking up and down the stairs for a while, you go and sit in your own bedroom. This becomes uninteresting, however, and so you put on your hat and stroll out into the garden. This becomes uninteresting, however, after a time, and so you put on your hat and stroll out into the garden. You walk down the path, and as you pass the summer house, you glance in, and there's those two young idiots huddled up in one corner of it, and they see you and are evidently under the idea that, for some wicked purpose of your own, you're following them about. Why don't they have a special room for this sort of thing and make people keep to it, you mutter, and you rush back to the hall to get your umbrella and go out. It must have been very much like this when that foolish boy, Henry VIII, was courting his little Anne. People in Buckinghamshire would have come upon them unexpectedly when they were mooning around Windsor and Raysbury, and have exclaimed, Oh, you here? And Henry would have blushed and said, Yes, he'd just come over to see a man, and Anne would have said, Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Isn't it funny? I've just met Mr. Henry the Eighth in the lane, and he's going the same way I am. Then those people would have gone away and said to themselves, Oh, we'd better get out of here while this billing and cooing is on. We'll go down to Kent. And they would go to Kent, and the first thing they would see in Kent when they got there would be Henry and Anne fooling around Hever Castle. Oh, drat this, they would say. Here, let's go away. I can't stand any more of it. Now let's go to St. Albans. A nice quiet place, St. Albans. And when they reached St. Albans, there would be that wretched couple kissing under the abbey walls, and these folks would go and be pirates until the marriage was over. From Picnic Point to Old Windsor Lock is a delightful bit of the river. A shady road, dotted here and there with dainty little cottages, runs by the bank up to the bells of Oosley, a picturesque inn, as most upriver inns are, and a place where a very good glass of ale may be drunk. So Harris says, and in a matter of this kind you can take Harris's word. Old Windsor's a famous spot in its way. Edward the Confessor had a palace here, and the great Earl Godwin was proved guilty by the justice of that age, and having encompassed the death of the king's brother. Earl Godwin broke a piece of bread and held it in his hand. If I am guilty, said the Earl, may this bread choke me when I eat it. Then he put the bread into his mouth and swallowed it, and it choked him, and he died. After you pass Old Windsor, the river is somewhat uninteresting does not become itself again until you're near Boveney. George and I towed up past the home park, which stretches along the right bank from Albert to Victoria Bridge. And as we were passing Datchet, George asked me if I remembered our first trip up the river, and when we landed at Datchet at ten o'clock at night and wanted to go to bed. I answered that I did remember it. It will be some time before I forget it. It was a Saturday before the August bank holiday. We were tired and hungry, we same three, and when we got to Datchet, we took out the hamper, the two bags, and the rugs and coats, and such like things, and started off to look for diggings. We passed a very pretty little hotel, with clematis and creeper over the porch, but there was no honeysuckle about it, and for some reason or other, I'd got my mind fixed on honeysuckle, and said, oh, don't let's go in there, let's go on a bit further and see if there isn't one with honeysuckle over it. So we went on until we came to another hotel. That was a very nice hotel, too, and it had honeysuckle on it, round at the side. But Harris did not like the look of a man who was leaning against the front door. He said he didn't look like a nice man at all, and he wore ugly boots. So we went on further. We went a goodish way without coming across any more hotels. And then we met a man and asked him to direct us to a few. He said, Why, you're coming away from them. You must turn right around and go back, and then you will come to the stag. We said, oh, we'd been there and didn't like it. No honeysuckle over it. Well then, he said, 
There's the manor house, just opposite. Have you tried that? Harris replied that we did not want to go there. Didn't like the looks of a man who was stopping there. Harris did not like the color of his hair. Didn't like his boots, either. Well, I don't know what you'll do, I'm sure, said our informant, because they are the only two inns in the place. No other inns, exclaimed Harris. None, replied the man. What on earth are we to do, cried Harris. Then George spoke up. He said Harris and I could get a hotel built for us if we liked, have some people made to put in. For his part, he was going back to the stag. The greatest minds never realize their ideals in any matter. Harris and I sighed over the hollowness of all earthly desires and followed George. We took our traps into the stag and laid them down in the hall. The landlord came up and said, Good evening, gentlemen. Oh, good evening, said George. We want three beds, please. I'm very sorry, sir, said the landlord. But I'm afraid we can't manage it. Oh, well, never mind, said George. Two will do. Two of us can sleep in one bed, can't we? He continued turning to Harris and me. Harris said, Oh, yes. He thought George and I could sleep in one bed very easily. Very sorry, sir, again repeated the landlord, but we really haven't got a bed vacant in the whole house. In fact, we're putting two, even three gentlemen in one bed as it is. This staggered us for a bit. But Harris, who's an old traveler, rose to the occasion and laughing cheerily said, Oh, well, we can't help it. We must rough it. You must give us a shakedown in the billiard room. Very sorry, sir. Three gentlemen sleeping on the billiard table already, and two in the coffee room. Can't possibly take you in tonight. We picked up our things and went over to the manor house. It was a pretty little place. I said I thought I should like it better than the other house, and Harris said, Oh, yes, it would be all right, and we needn't look at the man with the red hair. And besides, the poor fellow couldn't help having red hair. Harris spoke quite kindly and sensibly about it. The people at the manor house did not wait to hear us talk. The landlady met us on the doorstep with the greeting that we were the 14th party she had turned away within the last hour and a half. As for our meek suggestions of stables, billiard room, and coal cellars, she laughed them all to scorn. All these nooks had been snatched up long ago. Did she know of any place in the whole village where we could get shelter for the night? Well, we didn't mind roughing it. She did not recommend it, mind, but there was a little beer shop a half mile down the Eaton Road. We waited to hear no more. We caught up the hamper and the bags and the coats and the rugs and parcels and ran. The distance seemed more like a mile than half a mile, but we reached the place at last and rushed, panting, into the bar. The people at the beer shop were rude. They merely laughed at us. There were only three beds in the whole house, and they had seven single gentlemen and two married couples sleeping there already. A kind-hearted bargeman, however, who happened to be in the tap room, thought we might try the grocer's, next door to the stag, and we went back. The grocer's was full. An old woman we met in the shop, then kindly took us along with her for a quarter of a mile to a lady friend of hers, who occasionally let rooms to gentlemen. This old woman walked very slowly, and we were twenty minutes getting to her lady friends. She enlivened the journey by describing to us, as we trailed along, the various pains she had in her back. Her lady friends' rooms were let. From there, we were recommended to number 27. Number 27 was full, and sent us to number 32, and 32 was full. Then we went back into the high road, and Harris sat down on the hamper and said he would go no further. He said it seemed a quiet spot. He would like to die there. He requested George and me to kiss his mother for him, and to tell all his relations that he forgave them and died happy. At that moment, an angel came by in the disguise of a small boy, and I cannot think of any more effective disguise an angel could have assumed. With a can of beer in one hand, and the other, something at the end of a string, which he let down onto every flat stone he came across, then pulled up again, this producing a peculiarly unattractive sound, suggestive of suffering. We asked this heavenly messenger, as we discovered him afterwards to be, if he knew of any lonely house whose occupants were few and feeble, old ladies or paralyzed gentlemen preferred. 
who could be easily frightened into giving up their beds for the night to three desperate men, or, if not this, could he recommend us to an empty pigsty, or a disused lime kiln, or anything of that sort. He did not know of any such place, at least not one handy, but he said that if we liked to come with him, his mother had a room to spare and could put us up for the night. We fell upon his neck there in the moonlight and blessed him, and it would have made a very beautiful picture if the boy himself had not been so overpowered by our emotion as to be unable to sustain himself under it and sunk to the ground, letting us all down on top of him. Harris was so overcome with joy that he fainted and had to seize the boy's beer can and half empty it or he could recover consciousness. And then he started off at a run and left George and me to bring on the luggage. It was a little four-roomed cottage where the boy lived and his mother, good soul, gave us hot bacon for supper, and we ate it all, five pounds, and a jam tart afterwards, and two pots of tea, and then we went to bed. There were two beds in the room. One was a two-foot, six-inch truckle bed, and George and I slept in that, and kept in by tying ourselves together with a sheet. And the other was the little boy's bed, and Harris had that all to himself, and we found him in the morning with two feet of bare legs sticking out at the bottom and George and I used it to hang the towels on while we bathed. We were not so uppish about what sort of hotel we would have next time we went to Datchet. To return to our present trip, nothing exciting happened, and we tugged steadily on to a little below Monkey Island, where we drew up and lunched. We tackled the cold beef for lunch, and then we found that we'd forgotten to bring any mustard. I don't think I ever in my life, before or since, felt I wanted mustard as badly as I felt I wanted it then. I don't care for mustard as a rule. It's very seldom that I take it at all, but I would have given worlds for it then. I don't know how many worlds there may be in the universe, but anyone who brought me a spoonful of mustard that precise moment could have had them all. I grow reckless like that when I want a thing and can't get it. Harris said he would have given worlds for mustard too, it would have been a good thing for anybody who had come to that spot with a can of mustard. He would have been set up in worlds for the rest of his life. But there, I dare say both Harris and I would have tried to back out of the bargain after we had got the mustard. One makes these extravagant offers in moments of excitement, but, of course, when one comes to think of it, one sees how absurdly out of proportion they are with the value of the required article. I heard a man, going up a mountain in Switzerland, once say he would give worlds for a glass of beer, and when he came to a little shanty where they kept it, he kicked up a most fearful row because they charged him five francs for a bottle of bass. He said it was a scandalous imposition, and he wrote to the Times about it. It cast a gloom over the boat, there being no mustard. We ate our beef in silence. Existence seemed hollow and uninteresting. We thought of the happy days of childhood and sighed. We brightened up a bit, however, over the apple tart. And when George drew out a tin of pineapple from the bottom of the hamper and rolled it into the middle of the boat, we felt that life was worth living after all. We are very fond of pineapple, all three of us. We looked at the picture on the tin. We thought of the juice. We smiled at one another. Harris got a spoon ready. Then we looked for the knife to open the tin with. We turned out everything in the hamper. We turned out the bags. We pulled up the boards at the bottom of the boat. We took everything out on the bank and shook it. There was no tin opener to be found. Then Harris tried to open the tin with a pocket knife and broke the knife and cut himself badly. And George tried a pair of scissors. And the scissors flew up and nearly put his eye out. While they were dressing their wounds, I tried to make a hole in the thing, the spiky end of the hitcher. And the hitcher slipped and jerked me out between the boat and the bank into two feet of muddy water, and the tin rolled over, uninjured, and broke a teacup. Then we all got mad. We took that tin out on the bank, and Harris went up into the field and got a big sharp stone, and I went back to the boat and brought out the mast, and George held the tin, and Harris held the sharp end of the stone against the top of it, and I took the mast and poised it high up in the air and gathered up all my strength and brought it down. It was George's straw hat that saved his life that day. He keeps that hat now, 
what's left of it. And on a winter's evening, when the pipes are lit, the boys are telling stretchers about the dangers they have passed through. George brings it down and shows it round. And the stirring tale is told anew, with fresh exaggerations every time. Harris got off with merely a flesh wound. After that, I took the tin off myself and hammered at it with the mast till I was worn out and sick at heart, whereupon Harris took it in hand. We beat it out flat. We beat it back square. We battered it into every form known to geometry. But we could not make a hole in it. Then George went at it and knocked it into a shape so strange, so weird, so unearthly in its wild hideousness that he got frightened and threw away the mast. So we all three sat round it on the grass and looked at it. There was one great dent across the top that had the appearance of a mocking grin, and it drove us furious so that Harris rushed at the thing and caught it up and flung it far into the middle of the river. And as it sank, we hurled our curses at it. And we got into the boat and rowed away from the spot and never paused till we reached Maidenhead. Maidenhead itself is too snobby to be pleasant. It's the haunt of the river swell and his overdressed female companion. It's the town of showy hotels, patronized chiefly by dudes and ballet girls. It is the witch's kitchen from which go forth those demons of the river. Steam launches. The London Journal Duke always has his little place at Maidenhead. And the heroine of the three-volume novel always dines there when she goes out on the spree with someone else's husband. We went through Maidenhead quickly, and then eased up, and took leisurely that grand reach beyond bolters and cookham locks. Clevedon Woods still wore their dainty dresses spring, and rose up from the water's edge in one long harmony of blended shades of fairy green. In its unbroken loveliness, this is perhaps the sweetest stretch of all the river, and lingeringly we slowly drew our little boat away from its deep peace. We pulled up in the backwater, just below Cookham, and had tea, and when we were through the lock, it was evening. A stiffish breeze had sprung up, in our favor for a wonder, for as a rule of the river, the wind is always dead against you whatever way you go. It's against you in the morning when you start for a day's trip, and you pull a long distance, thinking how easy it will be to come back with the sail. And then after tea, the wind veers round, and you have to pull hard in its teeth all the way home. When you forget to take the sail at all, then the wind is consistently your favor both ways. But there, this world is only a probation, and man was born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. This evening, however, they'd evidently made a mistake and had put the wind round at our back instead of in our face. We kept very quiet about it and got the sail up quickly before they found it out. And then we spread ourselves about in the boat in thoughtful attitudes, and the sail bellied out and strained and grumbled at the mast, and the boat flew. I steered. There's no more thrilling sensation I know of than sailing. It comes as near to flying as man has got to yet, except in dreams. The wings of the rushing wind seem to be bearing you onward. You know not where. You are no longer the slow, plodding, puny thing of clay, creeping torturously upon the ground. You are a part of nature. Your heart is throbbing against hers. Her glorious arms are round you, raising you up against her heart. Your spirit is at one with hers. Your limbs grow light. The voices of the air are singing to you. The earth seems far away and little, and the clouds, so close above your head, are brothers, and you stretch your arms to them. We had the river to ourselves, except that, far in the distance, we could see a fishing punt, moored in midstream, on which three fishermen sat, and we skimmed over the water and past the wooded banks, and no one spoke. I was steering. As we drew near, we could see that the three men fishing seemed old and solemn-looking men. They sat on three chairs in the punt and watched intently their lines. And the red sunset threw a mystic light upon the waters and tinged with fire the towering woods and made a golden glory of the piled-up clouds. It was an hour of deep enchantment, of ecstatic hope and longing. 
The little sail stood out against the purple sky. The gloaming lay round us, wrapping the world in rainbow shadows, and behind us crept the night. We seemed like knights of some old legend, sailing across some mystic lake into the unknown realm of twilight, unto the great land of the sunset. We did not go into the realm of twilight. We went slap into that punt, where those three old men were fishing. We did not know what had happened at first, because the sail shut out the view. But from the nature of the language that rose up in the upon the evening air, we gathered that we had come into the neighborhood of human beings, and that they were vexed and discontented. Harris let the sail down, and then we saw what had happened. We had knocked those three old gentlemen off their chairs into a general heap at the bottom of the boat, and they were now slowly and painfully sorting themselves out from each other, picking fish off themselves, and as they worked, they cursed us. Not with a common cursory curse, but with long, carefully thought out, comprehensive curses that embraced the whole of our career and went away into the distant future and included all our relations and covered everything connected with us. Good, substantial curses. Harris told them they ought to be grateful for a little excitement, sitting there fishing all day, and he also said that he was shocked and grieved to hear men of their age give way to temper so. But it did not do any good. George said he would steer after that. He said a mind like mine ought not to be expected to give away itself in steering boats. Better let a mere commonplace human being see after the boat, for we jolly well all got drowned, and he took up the lines and brought us up to Marlow. And at Marlow, we left the boat by the bridge and went and put up for the night at the Crown. That completes this installment of Classics You Slept Through's rendition of Three Men in a Boat, Say Nothing of the Dog by Jerome K. Jerome. Please join us in our next episode where we discuss this section. You can send us your thoughts and follow us along on social media at CYSTPod or email us CYSTPod at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>